Welcome to Aging with Attitude. My name is Anthony, as you know, and I have a uh, well, Susie isn't a guest, so hey. <laughs> I'd like to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we do have a, a guest today, and I'll let, you, I'll let her introduce herself to you. And then we're going to have some, a conversation around um, what she does in the community. It will be fascinating reading from my perspective. Um, so would you like to say hello to the audience? Sure. Hi, I am Mel, and I work for um, the Salvation Army for Oasis for a gambling harm reduction service here in the Wairarapa. And... Um, Love here as well. So it's nice to be with you guys this morning. <laughs> Kia ora, Mel. <laughs> I got the name right today, so that's really exciting. Um, yeah, so what can you tell us about your role? Um, and yeah, I realise that uh, you have, your name is a little bit different. It's Oasis. Salvation Army? Yeah, so we're, we're called Oasis, but we come under what we call Addiction and Reintegration Service, which is, a, um, I guess, an arm of the Salvation Army. So Oasis, it's kind of a bit tricky because it's a separate identity. Mm. We've got a contract with Te Whato Order um, to provide gambling harm um, reduction services. But um, the Salvation Army has, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Bridge Programme. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. quite an old programme, isn't it? It is an yeah. old programme. So we're our closest, yeah. um, it's a live-in, um, I think it's a 10-week um, live-in rehab, um, drug and alcohol rehab programme. And our closest is Wellington. Um, and then we also have transitional housing and things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we um, sit under that umbrella, I guess, but our, but we are employed by the Salvation Army. So it's a bit tricky. But generally, I just tell people I work for Oasis because so, yeah. otherwise it gets a bit confusing. Yeah, it becomes, the name becomes so long that people don't know. They lose what, the, what they were going to say. Or yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So is there, are that, sorry for cutting in, Susie. Okay. I said I wasn't going to say much, but... <laughs> can't help himself, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that's I'll beat right. him later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of um, the name, mm. Oasis, is it to conjure up uh, for the people who uh, are living with addiction issues, gambling, um, that security and safety place being an Oasis? Absolutely. It's a, um, yeah, I think... And actually, when I think about the client experience, like some of the feedback that we get is that I guess for somebody who's experienced gambling harm, um, often things get really bad before they seek help. So um, some of the feedback that we get is that it's such a kind of relief to get all of that, um, all of that stuff that they've been kind of holding and struggling with out and to um, to kind of have um, a sense of safety and that there's no sense of judgment in the room is kind of what so I mm. guess that that must feel like a bit of an oasis so maybe mm. yeah I was just thinking in terms of um, walking through the Sahara you know these pockets of um, safety places or knowing where they are so you if you're on that journey mm. and we know that addictions there isn't you just don't get better it, it takes a while absolutely and so they, they, they know that there's um pockets where they can go to and uh, seek refuge yep. from the sandstorms mm. totally mm. yeah <laughs> so how bad do you think um do you have any like figures or um idea of how many people are affected by gambling harm in the Wairarapa at all so um it's tr one of the things that makes coming up with a stat tricky is that people don't tend to seek help till things are really difficult. Mm. What we so, but we do do something which is called um, a brief harm screen, which kind of helps us gauge what's happening in the community. And look, um, in my role at the moment, I'm um, I've done a bunch of different roles with. Uh, with within Oasis at the moment, I'm um, doing a health promotion role. And so the great thing about that is you're talking with people in the community. So feedback from the community is that people are really worried about their whānau with um, online pokies. Yeah. Um, and so what I can tell you is in some stats is that um, in Masterton in the last year, over five million dollars was lost on pokey machines alone. Wow! So we only have four venues here in Masterton, 
Um, and then in South Wairapa, um, over 1.6 million. And that's just on Pokey, so not talking about TAB or anything like that. Mm. Um, and generally what we know um, about, you know, we know things like, I mean, the reality is 70 Oh, seventy percent um, of adults gamble, and you know a lot of a lot of gambling can be done safely, but it's a very small proportion of the population um, which is um, experiencing that real severe harm. Um, and yeah, but I can I can look up some <laughs> some more specific stats if you want. Yeah, I think um, it sort of came to a head really, didn't it? Around um, I know when we had lockdowns and stuff like that, the income from um, gambling or pokies was quite um, reduced. However, as you say, um, there is um, people can actually get on a website and and you know gamble from their home really without any knowledge of anyone that's living with them you know that they may be doing that which is quite a worry isn't it yeah absolutely i mean when you're when you're kind of on your phone no one really knows what no. you're what you're doing and i guess if you're on a bigger computer screen then maybe if people are in the room it's a bit more visible but phones are really hard and look we've had um people who have tried to them they can block themselves from websites which is really good but things like um the algorithms through yeah. social media and stuff mm. you'll get ads on facebook Facebook or um, whatever kind of social media you're on, just drawing people back in. So it's really, um, really tricky for people to get away from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're right, in lockdown, we saw, I mean, there was obviously people couldn't go out to venues. So there was like this, this you could see in the stats, they went from being really high to zero, zero spend, but then jumped right back up to where, to pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And we know that... Um, look the the spend or what we call losses is increasing so um and that's not taking into consideration the online pokies because um we 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 don't have a good measure of that because it's unregulated so yeah it's definitely it's definitely um a very real problem mm. Mm. um when what sort of cause what sort of things cause someone to be you know, you say that seventy percent of um, our community gamble, mm -hmm. um, but you know, do we call lotto gambling? <coughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, the, oh, actually, the the definition of gambling is something like, oh, this will be tricky. Can I remember it off the top of my head? But is when we um, risk um, something generally of um, of um, monetary value. On an uncertain outcome, so it's quite, um, you know. I mean, people can wager cars, you know. Mm. Uh, bet yeah. you this, so it doesn't mm. have to be money. So absolutely, we see. Um, look, um, participating in your local school raffle is a um, is gambling. Yes, but we don't generally see harm from that no. kind of stuff. It's fundraising. So, yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think the good thing about that is it takes away a bit of the stigma because we all get, you know, very yeah. few people actually don't gamble. Mm. So it makes the conversation a bit safer. But um, look, their lotto, um, the harm caused by lotto is generally a lot lower than other forms of gambling um, because you, I mean, you buy a lotto ticket and then you don't know if you've won or you've, or you've lost until that draw has been take, uh, yeah. has been made. Whereas with something like a pokies machine, you sit at it, the, the thing that makes it so enticing and so easily to get addicted to is that the machine is giving you constant feedback and it knows how to, to produce enough of a reward to keep the player going. I mean, the, ga the, the machines are designed mm. to keep people playing because that's how they make money. So... Um, the the it's what we call continuous forms of gambling which are um more risky and that's mm. about getting how quickly is the the person that's gambling getting that feedback mm. does that make any sense yeah, so it's a maladaptive pattern and be, and behavior that's what we can term it as it's because if in a lot of say if i'm spending say three hundred dollars a week 
just buying the lottery tickets with the hope of winning something and I only get $500 a week. Okay, then we would say you are absolutely right. impacted by gambling. Yeah. yeah, so th I guess that's one of the questions we ask people. We ask them, um, you know, how are you betting more than you can afford to lose is one of the qu qu key questions and how much time are you spending? Have you found yourself lying to, to somebody? So what you're saying about the lotto spend in that case is absolutely harmful. Mm. But I guess we don't generally see that... Um, that as much with lotto mm. um, ticket spending. However, I have um, seen before where somebody has ended up excluding them from the pokey, so they can't kind of do that anymore. How um, and so they've they've stopped doing that, and then they've kind of noticed that they're kind of spending a little bit more on lotto tickets, and they're in that older age range where they are on a pension, so they actually. A lot of can get quite expensive, so you know it's looking at those finer <clears throat> details. Mm. Yeah, you're you're right in there. In terms of um, gender, okay, what's the split? Ah, so I actually <clears throat> have. Um, so, do you want to know general? Uh, so for for older people, um, it's mostly an even sl split between um, males and females. Um, and they tend to wage um, similar amounts to other age ranges, but I guess that can be more risky as many, many older people have more of a fixed or maybe a limited income. Mm -hmm. So the risk is a little bit higher. Yeah. That's interesting. That um, Like when, so let's say have a look at pokies. Is it more males um, gambling on pokies, or is it more females? Um, so, in the general population, yep. um, again, we see, um, we know, look, that um, Māori and Pacifica are more impacted, and slightly, yeah, I think it would be fair to say that we see more males than females. Um, However, locally, um, a part of my role is that I pop in and, and visit um, fee, uh, visit venues as a part of my role, and um, I will um, often see um, older. Um, I'm talking when I say older, I'm talking retired, aged um, females playing in the middle of the in the middle of the day. So I think, yeah, it's yeah, hard to capture those um, local stats, but yeah. My grandson and I were walking past the, um, or one of the pubs, I won't say which one. Mm. Um, <laughs> we were going to um, the car boot sale. Mm. Okay, and he said to me, Guru, what the, what's gaming? Because uh, he was thinking about, you know, his yeah. Minecraft or whatever they call it. Yeah. So I said, well, it's this boy. He goes, oh, that's dumb, Google. I said, why is it dumb? He goes, well, um, you always lose money on that. And there was two older ladies there, and they said to him, but you might win something too. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. It was crazy. Wow. He said, no, you lose it. And they said, no, you might win something. And I'm like, come on, let's go. Mm. Um, and I was going, my goodness, that the, the attitude towards it, yeah. And it, it is that hope, because that's what gambling is. Mm, totally. It's a hope. That I might win. That I might win. And what our brains do is they over, you know, if we're engaged in gambling, they overestimate the wins and they underestimate the losses. So mm. you can see why um, it would be interesting to have a, to a conversation with those ladies to ask them some more questions, like such as, so how much time out of your week do you think you might spend in the pokies room? And mm. um, because... Um, yeah, the machines are created in a way that um, gets people locked in. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy in terms of um, the ability uh, for those machines to do that. If I initially get a, a, a reward, I read some some articles somewhere that after the initial um, adrenaline hit, mm -hmm. that's what it is, um, it didn't matter if they lost all the time. They wanted to feel that there's something happening for mm. them there might be a hope and that kept them there yeah even if they lost all the time yeah it was that uh, this this next one could be it this yeah. next one could be it yeah 
I mean, they are tapped into the, they know how to tap into the reward centre of the brain to mm. get that dopamine hit. And um, one of the things um, we talk to people about is what was their first experience, oh, what age did they start? Um, what was, you know, is it something that they observed in their family? But also, what was their first experience like? And you will hear stories that people might have won the first time. You know, they might have won a few hundred dollars or... Um, and then, again, so they're chasing, they're chasing the win and chasing the... Um, yeah, that, that to get one of the questions we ask is, are you needing to play more and more to try and get the same level of excitement? Mm-hmm. Um you know, you're looking for that first hit that you got, that first thing of tolerance. dopamine. Pardon? Tolerance. Yeah, oh, absolutely, that your tolerance builds up and you, um, yeah, which is, I mean, it's like, it's addiction, isn't it? Mm. It's what, um, but the way, yeah, I think the way in which, um, you know, about the, the variable rate ratio of reward, the difference between, have you guys heard of the experiment that was done, um, Back in, I think it was 1950s, um, they had some um, mice, and mm. if they, Skinners. what's that? Skinners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they knew how to hit, tap the wheel, uh, hit a lever. Sorry, um, when they hit the le- lever, they um, got a food, um, got a food pellet. Um, anyway, when the food pellet was. Um, released at regular intervals the the mouse or mice whatever you call it would only hit the lever when it was hungry however when the um food pellet was le- was released at um random ratio like it didn't know when the reward was coming the mouse sat there and Wait. pressed the lever again and again and again and again wow. um, and that shows um, that's kind of like the basis of the way that these machines um, are designed. So they will do things like uh, the machines will um, do something which is called a loss disguised as a win. So the machine will go, brrr, oh, like, say so you've put oh. in a dollar, it will go, brrr, you've just won 30 cents. Well, you haven't actually just won 30 cents. You've lost 70. Yeah. But they, you know, there's all the bright lights and everything like that. And so it's it's giving your brain enough of a hit to keep you engaged in the mm. game. So we try and tell people that. Yeah. So it's educating people that it's not them, you know. It's yeah. that this thing has been designed mm. to tap into the chemicals in your brain to keep you playing and then, you know, doing that thing. Okay, like so let's start tracking how much are you actually putting into the machine and then people can go, Oh, oh flip, you know, and that, that kind of light bulb moment. moment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because the machine is actually controlling them continuing to play and then they forget how much money they've had or, or, or how much time that yeah. they've spent there because, you lose yeah. it because you're this thing you're all of your um you're just completely locked in and present in that moment you get forget about all your worries mm. you know it's a bit like um the casinos isn't it when you go to las vegas the casinos are a uh, you, there are no windows. You don't know what time of day it is. Time can fly pretty fast. You get food delivered to you. You're sitting there like the mouse, <laughs> you know, doing that, that dopamine hit. And it is really quite scary when you think about how that can control someone's life. Totally. Yep. Yep. I remember um, watching one program and it was this woman. She had won around about a, a half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. And so the casino said to her, so bring your family mm. and mm. all food, drinks, all free. You've got the suite that you once can have. And so if you want to stay, do that. If you want to go, great. And so she brought her family. Yeah, well, she lost it all in a matter of a night. One night. One night. Far yeah, out. Because, again, it was, I won a, a half million next minute. Uh, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. She lost more than what she, um, she lost her home. <laughs> yeah. That's what she ended up doing, losing her home of that one particular incident. Mm. Yeah, because she, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, her husband was saying to her, hey, come on, let's go. You know, we've got a lot of money. 
It's scope. No. Yeah, what's that addicted for her? Yeah. It was interesting. Yeah. Mm. And I think, you know, when we think about um, older people, what what are some of the things that you guys think would um, make older people more um, more likely to be harmed by it? I've got, I've got some things um, here, um, but I wondered what, like, if you guys are aware mm. of um, anything. I guess older people like... To you know, if older people are lonely, uh, something like the pokies, you know, you, you get your regular people that are there at a certain time of the day or whatever. Um, it's um, a meeting place, I guess, is, and social. Um, yeah, and I guess wanting to feel like you um, can do better for yourself and maybe win a little bit extra. Uh, yeah, there's lots of... Lots of things, are, and older people are a lot more vulnerable to be enticed, I think, to those sorts of things because mm -hmm. um, they may not have a lot of other things going on in their life. I think this the social thing is absolutely, what are you laughing at? Oh, it's all right. My, my, sometimes my brain goes to places <laughs> that I laugh all the time. Oh, okay. um, but after you finish that, I'll tell you what I was laughing enticed. about. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think that um, you're right, like about the social, that's one of the things I had noted down, the social aspect, what can start out as, um, oh, well, you know, I'll pop down and have a drink and catch up with people, Can um, while it can start as that can be the one of the ways that people end up um, harmfully gambling and it's a good I guess it's just one of those things that people should be aware of maybe um like if you are going to do it as a social thing being really clear like how much time am I going to spend how much money am I going to spend but um because I've certainly heard stories of older women who never played before and then had more time and, and mm. not locally I've heard of a story where um they would go around retirement villages and pick people up <gasps> good to know it's not an local outing. so I'm not yeah, <laughs> out, an outing to venues mm. and so it was great to start off with but then um this yeah I've heard of people who have lost a lot because yeah from what started out socially um and I think also being aware of if I'm gonna do that am I actually talk who am I actually talking to mm. at the venue mm. um or am I, yeah, sitting behind a screen thinking I'm being social, but I'm actually being hooked in, yeah. The reason I was laughing, <coughs> excuse me, and it may seem crazy, but it is what it is. Why do people get hooked on it? Now, we talked about the release of dopamines and mm. uh, endorphins. So... A lot of that can happen when you're in company with the person that you, your husband or your wife or whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. So could it be that what is happening to me, I'm um, forming a relationship because I want to feel um, loved because of those endorphins, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'll give that type of relationship. I feel good about this. And so I stay there because... I want to feel that again for older people because mm. those people that they um, had in their life could be all gone. Mm. Yeah, look, I've absolutely heard stories where um, people haven't played the pokies or maybe they've played a tiny bit, but they've lost somebody. And so there's been a sense, um, you know, obviously that they're grieving. And look, grief is such a difficult emotion to sit with, eh? So um, where there's been grief, they end up playing and that's the thing that provides them with some temporary relief. Um, and then, so they do it and it feels good. So then they go again and again and again. And um, and then before they know it, they look they've lost money. They've you know and losing you know finding themselves lying to people that they care about mm -hmm. because they are wanting to get that um, that distraction. I think another really um, important thing that um, talking 
from talking with people who have been really harmed by gambling and have come out the other end, they say, oh, you know, I would go to get away from difficult you know, people have different mm, drivers, yeah, but go to get yeah. away, you know, are, are you avoiding stress or are you looking for money, whatever. So people who have um, either had grief in their life or wanting to avoid the feeling of stress have said to me, oh, so they would go in and that for them it would be about trying to suppress a difficult emotion. So I feel good when I, I'm in there, but then when I leave, my head is down, mm, empty. Your fucker, ma. I don't mm. feel good, mm. you know. And so noticing, yeah, and and yeah, you feel empty. So, yeah, that's um, I think that's an important thing to think about if you're, yeah. How do I feel afterwards? Yeah, and and that too is is can be a trap as well because I feel this way. How do I feel happy again? I walk back in. Absolutely. And and that's where the gambling, like part of the harm, because then the gambler, the person who is gambling, then they think they're automatic, how do I get my how do I get cash so I can get back in? And it, and, um, and it becomes this cycle mm. of thinking that is going to be, if it's about money, it's about gambling is going to think be the thing that gets me out of trouble. If it's about stress, it's a like, oh, that's the thing that made me feel better, so I need to go back in. Yeah, yeah it's it's an ugly thing. And um, for me, it's one of the worst addictions there is because it can cause a loss instantly in terms of, say, a couple of hours. You can lose everything yep. just in a couple of hours. Totally, yeah. Yep. So that's why it's ugly. Um, for me, mm. yeah, and look, uh, look, I um, have talked with people who have been abstinent for some time, and they've they've thought, um, you know, we we talk a lot about how relapse is a part of recovery, right? You know, it's not it's not a black and white thing, but they've been doing really really well, and then they've kind of had a bit of a oh, I think I might be all right, and they'll go back in, and then within a very short amount of space, they've mm. lost everything that they've kind of saved, and that's really difficult for people. Mm. But, yeah. Yeah, because then they get on that cycle of, I'm really useless now. You know, I, I beat it, now I'm, I'm back in it, and so, oh, what the heck, I'm all carry on doing it. <laughs> exactly. Type of mentality. Yeah, and, and then those old, you know, so I guess when you think about an addiction being developed, there's that reward, uh, that those pathways in the brain, right, that habit, and then when someone has a relapse, it can very quickly... Um, they go back to that old way of thinking of, oh no, I've got to, I've got to play again because that's going to be get the thing that gets me out of trouble. And then, yeah, it's not... back right into it. Yeah. yeah. How do you assess if someone is um, has an issue with gambling? What are the assessment tools that you use? So there, there's a few different, there's a few different assessment tools. But look, on a really simple level, we mm -hmm. would say to someone, do you ever feel like you've had a problem with um, gambling and so that's one you know how, how does someone feel about it um, have you ever lied to somebody about how 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 much time you spend gambling or how much money you spent gambling um, have um, have you ever been worried about the way that you feel after you've been gambling is another one um, and I think something that gets it um, that the other side of it is we always check in with people like do you think you've ever been impacted by somebody else's gambling because you know that um for every person who gambles there's about 10 people around them who are impacted so when you talked about our service earlier a part of what our services um does is not only um talk um work with the person who is experiencing gambling harm themselves but also support what we call affected other. Mm -hmm. So someone might have a gamble and uh, be suffering really severe gambling harm themselves, but they're not ready to, to do anything about that. Um, but their whānau might be really, really worried or look, they, they might have even um, been lending money or they might have had money stolen off mm. them or, um, and so they too can access our service. Um, and look, 
I know something that's happened locally is even employers have been impacted by gambling harm because people have been, you know, stealing and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so asking people about how much um, time, um, money, how they feel about it, has the gambling caused them any stress or anxiety? Um, and then, yeah, and then we kind of go go from there and take a bit more of a dig into things. Um, and a part of that is, look, what, what how much, um, how much are you spending compared to how much money you, you know, what percentage of your earnings are you spending, that kind of stuff. Because mm. quite often when people actually, s they can think about how much money they're spending, but if they wrote it down, it's a bit like, you know, you're saying how much time you're spending um, at the pokies in particular. They actually can see it written and then they're quite, um, yeah, alarmed, um, I, I'm hoping, yeah, <laughs> by that. And do you know what, getting into that, that actual black and white stuff of actually how much are you spending okay let's not let's not take a while guess actually have a look at mm. let's have a look at your mm. have a look at your bank account and when people do that they're like oh my goodness you know but getting to that um yeah actually that's a really good if people are willing to do that that's a good sign mm. um because there's a whole lot of um you know, when we're doing something that's not good for us, you don't. It takes a while to we, get to you that put point it at the back of your mind, don't you? Because you don't really want to face it. Yeah. yeah. Like any other addiction, really. Yeah. So when you say that you work with them, like you may have um, those that are affected by gambling mm. contacting you rather than, than the actual gambler. How do you do? You give them like strategies or. Um, yeah. So um, it's it's kind of the tricky spaces because when people come to the service because they're they're worried about someone that they love, they're wanting to say, "How can I get that person here?" Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, and that's the hard bit is you can't control what that other person's behaviour. It's about keeping yourself safe. So, mm. you know, the conversation is different for everyone, but yeah. it might be, okay, it's time to stop lending money. It's time to, um, how are you looking up after your own health and well-being and are you safe? Um, so it's taking the focus away from the person who's gambling and put it, putting it on the... Um, looking at the wellness of the affected other, so yeah, and what are their um, what are their coping strategies, and what boundaries do they need to put in place to keep themselves safe? Um, and yeah, so there's yeah lots of different coping mm. strategies that people can draw on. Yeah, it's good to have some someone that's not actually in the picture giving them advice, isn't it? Because so so many families can can give advice, but um, having someone that you don't actually know but specialises in this process um, can be really really helpful. Give you an objective kind yeah. of point of view. So hard, eh? Because when it's our own family, it um, pulls at our heartstrings, and it's very difficult to. Um, very difficult to put some of those boundaries in place but mm. unfortunately if we don't it really impacts on our own well-being mm. so is, is there some sort of connection between alcohol and, and gambling oh know? absolutely because they they i mean the government's always you know doing licensing i'm i'm assuming to to do you know to have pokies running in communities and that's always been something that um, you know, people are saying, but it's causing so much harm. Why are you still doing this? Um, but I'm just listening to you talking. I'm thinking, you know, if pokies were taken away from a drinking environment, you know, do they, um, do, do communities have the option to challenge where, you know, how many machines are available and things like that? Yeah. So um, the, under the Gambling Act, there, um, every three years, the local council needs to look at what um, kind of review what policies that they've got in place and that's an opportunity where people can challenge um, what they're doing. So our local council has got what we call a I guess the slang term for it is a sinking lid policy which means that there can't be um, there's not going to be any new um, licenses put out there so there's kind of a um, eventually, over time, um, as venues close, um, you can't start up a new 
kind of pokies mm. venue. So that's good. And that over time, we should see a decrease yeah. in machines. Um, and within that, there is a relocation policy. So within six months, like if somebody had their lease, the, the building lease was taken off them, they can um, apply to relocate somewhere else. Yep. So in the, I guess, in the A plus standard of policies, we would say that there would be a sinking lid policy with no relocation. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so actually the council, so the Masterton and District Council and the two South Wairapa councils um, are going through that process at the moment. So we've just had a social impact assessment done, which is, um, I think, big, ups to the council and that they have um they ha that that they are doing their due mm. diligence so <clears throat> there's been a survey sent out so that they um they'll get that back and then they'll be talking about do they do they need to change anything in their um local policy or are they keep going to keep it as is if they were going to change something there'd be a process where people yeah. can kind of do submissions and mm. stuff which is great isn't it yeah it is really good um and yeah, that's our, our our time as a community. Say, look, this is the thing that we're really worried about, and yeah. Mm -hmm. So, from my perspective, the what might happen is that people just switch to online gambling. Mm -hmm. So, is there any moves to regulate that? Yes. Yeah, so, there's conversation going on at the moment about whether that becomes a regulated space or not. Um, and I think hopefully in the public arena we'll see some more um, debate around the pros and cons of that. Um, so what a um, so at the moment, and I think that's offshore is not regulated. And I'm trying to think about um, some of the pros and cons about. Um, if it was to be regulated, I wonder if we would see more advertising and more entitled, you know, more um, people being more, enti yeah, enticed than they are now. But at least in one respect, there'd be um, a sense in, when, in which we could measure it, whereas at the moment we can't measure anything. Mm. Um, yeah, what are your what are your guys' thoughts on that? Well, for me. I was just thinking it nice and simple. If I um, if I have if I like whiskey, and they and I can't drink whiskey, and I might just go to methamphetamine. Yeah, 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 yeah. So going to the black market kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah do that um, because at the end of the day, my my addiction, my behaviour, my mentality uh, hasn't changed, mm. and so because you can't. Just say, nope, you can't have anything. Because we saw that happening in uh, America, mm. the prohibition. Mm. And what happened there? Mm. Yeah, it just went out and more crime happened. Yeah. More crime happened. And so, uh, again, um, if I substitute it for something that is, would be detrimental to my behaviour, that's bad. But how do I, how do we encourage people to substitute it for something that is, uh, that will develop good behaviour? Mm. Yeah. And so uh, for me, like we talked before about an older person who might have lost someone and because of that loss, um, they're isolated, they feel, and so they might start um, gambling, they might. Um, so as a community, how do we wrap ourselves around that person so that, or as a whānau initially, so that um, that space is taken up with some some good yeah, instead of leaving, and most of it is leaving that person. You know, you're there for the tangi, great. But most of the time after the tangi is when you're sleeping in your bed by yourself and your partner's not there now. Mm. That's when you feel it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's when you feel it. And so you may do something, you know, to try and um, fill that void. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking in terms of as a community, uh, how do we wrap ourselves not only leaving it just um, to the expert, okay? Um, because there's only one of you, sorry, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Look, I think 
some of it, I was listening to um, a podcast the other day about our culture and about um, and, and about it was actually talking a lot about um, the way that our health is impacted by our culture and intergenerational living was mentioned. They talked about how the fabric of our society now has become so individualized that we, um, you know, you think back to the, I don't know, 1930s, 1950s, people generally lived and worked in the same kind of locations. There was less mm -hmm. of like going all the way overseas. Um, and <laughs> now you've got the laugh on again. <laughs> Yep. I was just thinking about Sw uh, Sweden. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and now we, I mean, I was a single, I was a single mum for, for a while. And I think we so often find ourselves in the Western culture, striving to do life independently, but actually we're created it, to be interdependent, right? And we right. need each other and we need Fano. And so I think to me, a lot of the solution is there. It's in um, how do we be community? Mm. And um, yeah, what I loved about the Aging with Attitude Expo was, you know, seeing everybody out and about. And I think, um, what have you guys got coming up soon? I know you were talking recently, there was something, are you going to have a games? What if, what what's on your calendar coming up? I, I guess our um, biggest thing for the year is the World Elder Abuse Awareness Week, um, which starts on the fifteenth of June. Yeah, and what are, what's some of the things that you're doing? So, that week? so we are looking in the pipe pipeline about organising just a get together and um, socialisation and building, um, you know people's mana, um, getting them involved in maybe some music because I just yeah. love the way music seems to lift you. I can totally. jump in the car, be in a real grump after working with Anthony all day and <laughs> my favourite song comes on and all of a sudden something's, you're in a something's flicked in my head totally and it's like, your oh, skate. on away. Yeah, so yeah, cool. so I really love the way that music um, you know, helps um, engage people really and yeah. um, the, the good side of, of that, it makes them feel a little but like dancing or you know there's other things that are associated with music and that's what we found at the expo wasn't it anthony um you know people really enjoyed the music there and yeah um yes. yeah yeah oh yeah, they, were yeah. they were amazing weren't they yeah amazing not only because it was um what they did in terms of the items that they performed but those younger ones able to start to uh, mingle with the older ones. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that intergenerational ones. connection, eh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, look, back in the day, lots of people used to go to church on a Sunday, didn't they? That was a mm. part of our kind of New Zealand culture, and I'm sure there were good things and bad things about that. But one of the good things would have been the intergenerational mm. connection that people were connected. Mm. And I just think that's a part of what, what we're missing. And when we mm. see healing um, in terms of the gambling stuff is often when the what's been hidden is brought to light mm. and we're able to, the very best success story as I've seen is when you get um, not only the person gambling but the affected others in the room and the sharing um, that that goes on there is such a big part of the healing journey um, and then and building you know build where trust has been broken building trust back up mm. um, and yeah that's the yeah and that that involves relationship right and I mm. think that's I don't I don't know about other people but I think that um, even I personally that you know, when it's so easy to stay at home and isolate, right? And mm. we're so much better off when we can connect with other people. So mm. I think that must be um, something that's really exciting about your work is seeing connections. people. Connections, mm. totally. We're made, we're made to connect, I think. Mm -hmm. Yates said something good. Uh, Yates is an Irish um, poet. Yeah. He said, man is not an island unto himself, but a part of a continent. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, we are part of that um, that continent and we do need each other. The um, One of the difficulties I find is 
um, about valuing each other. Yeah, because there's, it seems because of ageism, mm. um, people get to 65 and, oh, they've done their time. Mm. Totally. Get out of that job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is they have a wealth of experience mm. to continue to offer to the younger generation. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So yep. It seems to stop. Yeah. No, 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 no. And that's why as you're talking in terms of um, the family concept uh, mm. or community. Mm. Everyone in that community um, is, should, be, should have value. And they do have value. Yeah. But we need to be able to continually tap into uh, that value, that wisdom, so that they feel in themselves they have something to continue to uh, contribute. Yeah, I was just, as you were talking, I, um, I was thinking about, again, that's westernised culture, right? Like, oh, someone hit 65 and they haven't got the goods. Whereas you talk about things from a te Māori point of view and look, komatoa is the, the person, you tell me, but from the tiny bit that I know, that is the person of value in the community, right? Like the komatoa is who you go to to, for knowledge and mm. um, and is how and holds this like beautiful mana mm. <laughs> and mm. I think I recently heard um, this phrase that says what's good for Māori is good for all of us yeah. and I was like amen because <laughs> <laughs> like I hate I just feel like our westernised culture has got it wrong a lot of the time I think, I mean, there are some good things I shouldn't yeah. I don't want to sound negative but I just think man we've We've missed the boat. Like um, this podcast I was talking about, they were talking about how uh, the depression and how um, they were, this person was asking the person interviewed, but, um, oh, you're saying such bad things about our culture now, but like look back to the depression and how bad it was. And he said, actually, people were better off because even though they had less materialistically, they had community. They had each other. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Is um, this two sayings one is if there's an older person in your house then there's a treasure in your house yeah yep. and there's another one um, that says this it says remember me this is an older person talking mm. remember me for where you are once I was mm. and where I am one day you will be remember me gosh that's beautiful isn't it that's yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and that's what for me yeah you know that's what it's about yeah so what do you think we need to do as a community to value our older people more what do we do I think we need to be a bit less isolated in ourselves and be more yeah. I mean joining um, groups and and doing that social socialization or you know um, as you say you know um, Komatua and our older people in our community are the ones with all the knowledge and you know if we ask them for advice um, they're probably pretty up there on, on you know life's um, challenges that they've you know experienced as well so yeah making sure that we um we value older people in our community and try and make them feel valued yeah, yeah. and maybe we need to um lift lift um what's i'm looking for a word like promotion yeah. <laughs> like elevate their status and like be real conscient be really conscientious about raising um yeah their status in our community mm. Eh? Mm. It's, it's all about pushing yeah. someone to be treasured. Yeah, and educating younger people, I think, to to value um, older people in our community, which was great, as you say, for our um, expo. Yeah. Just those intermediate guys, I was listening to them, introducing themselves when people came in and giving them the pamphlets, and I was, you know, just making sure they were saying, you know, the right things, but they were amazing. Oh, that's They were so, so cool. connected, uh, and, and I thought it was just wonderful because they didn't need any coaxing. They knew all about it. That's yeah. so good. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> These um, wasn't the reason why it was interesting for me is how do you lead if you don't know how to serve? Yeah, yeah. And servanthood for me comes from once you're born, you taught that. Mm. Yeah. You put into positions where you do that. So when it comes to the time to for you to lead, you know what it is mm. to serve. Mm. 
Yeah. yeah. I remember one time I was, because I used to be a pastor. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Many years ago. Ah. And um, these young cats said to me, we want to preach. Uh, cool. Great. Great. Go and clean the toilets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't want to do that. Yeah. Until you learn how to be a servant. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. Cool. Because other, your ego will get in the way. Yeah. Yeah. And so, anyway, well, getting back to this. <laughs> okay. So, so um, before, because time's flowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just looking. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> they go so quickly. <laughs> and so what we haven't done, though, Mel, is if someone is living a with this issue, how do they get help? How yeah. do they contact you? Cool. Okay. So good to know that our service is free and accessible for anybody um, aged over 14. And so um, they can be really good if I had our 0800. I, I never ring the 0800 number. Um, so your website has got all the information on it because I had a look at it on the oh, weekend. Oh, did you? Good. It, it yes. is fabulous. Oh, good. Oasis Army, the Salvation, Oasis, the Salvation Army. And look, they can always call my mobile, which is 021-195-5158. Um, and can you just repeat that again, but yeah. a bit slower? Um, so 21 And I'm just going, I'm just looking for our... And, oh, in my bag, I do have a pamphlet. I like on your website, people can actually go on it and get some advice without actually approaching anyone. They can actually do a quiz. Absolutely. Um, just to, um, a bit about what you've said, you know, to identify in themselves, but, you know, is this gambling? Absolutely. I think that is great because a lot of people don't recognise that they have um, an issue. Yep. But to be able to do that online and in the privacy of your own home, you're not sort of talking to strangers. Totally. Perfect. I loved it. And look, mm. such a big thing about our service is it's, I think, anyone who you talk to, there will be no sense of it's just a mm. safe conversation. Yeah. Um, so look, 06 370 3317 or 0800 530 000. Mel, thank you so much for, Thanks for having me. our guest today. <laughs> and I uh, hope you had a good day yesterday on Mother's Day, both of you. Oh, uh, yeah. I made lawns. <laughs> okay. My husband did cook tea. That was awesome. <laughs> That's cool. And um, for our listeners, if you have any um, concerns, uh, ring uh, around gambling. Mm. Uh, ring Mel at a number. Or if you have any concerns around the elderly, ring us to mm. at 06 377 0066. That's 06 0066. Other than that, Mel, you had to Oh, yeah, I was just going to say it's if people ring the 06370 number, it's better because they will get to talk to someone Monday to Friday, whereas I only work three days a week. Okay. So, yeah, that's the better. They'll actually get to talk to someone that way. And you're actually based at the community centre? Yeah, based Street. at the yeah, based yeah. at the community centre in Perry Street. Mm. All right then. So um, for everyone else, lovely talking to you this morning, this um, cool, beautiful, beautiful <laughs> what it up in the morning. Sunny. Matiwa. <laughs> <laughs>